Hey, Retcon Raider here, and welcome back to uh, part two of my Wasteland 3 character generation overview. Last time, we went over the attributes, backgrounds, and character quirks, so today we'll be wrapping things up with the 22 assorted skills and the 80 assorted perks. Now, just like last time, we've got a lot of ground to cover here, so I will try to keep things moving relatively quickly, while also presenting all of the relevant information. Also worth noting that this is based on the beta, and all of this is still subject to change, so uh, take it with a grain of salt. That said, let's get started. First up, let's cover the basics. Like I said, there are 22 skills and 80 perks to choose from. You'll begin play with 3 skill points at first level, and gain an additional 3 skill points at each subsequent level. You'll also gain an additional plus 1 skill point for every 2 points you invest in intelligence, up to a maximum of 5 bonus skill points, and you can gain 1 extra skill point by taking one of the backgrounds that offers a free rank in one of the social skills. You can also gain an additional 1 skill point every 3rd level by taking the Poindexter quirk, though that will end up making your character much more fragile in the long run. By default, every skill will start at 0, but they can go as high as rank 10. However, it is important to note that as you boost a skill, it will become increasingly expensive to boost it to the next subsequent rank. In the beta, it costs 1 skill point for the first 3 ranks in a skill, 2 skill points for rank 4 and 5, 3 skill points for rank 6 and 7, 4 skill points for rank 8, 5 skill points for rank 9, and 6 skill points to actually max a skill out. That means taking a single skill all the way up to rank 10 will cost the player a hefty 28 skill points requiring just over 9 dedicated level-ups to actually accomplish. Thankfully, there are a couple of potential shortcuts, which theoretically would allow a player to still max out their skill at rank 8. Just like in Wasteland 2, the player will have access to both skill books as well as skill trinkets. Skill books are single-use items that will grant a plus 1 bonus to the relevant skill when read. Skill trinkets are similar in that they will also grant a plus one bonus to the relevant skill, but only as long as they're kept equipped in the utility slot. Unfortunately, that does mean that if the player wants to use cybernetics, they will not be able to use skill trinkets, because they both use the same slot. In theory, assuming a character has access to both the relevant book and trinket, they'll be able to save up to 11 skill points, while still effectively maxing out that skill. After that, we've got perks, which are uh, passive and active abilities that are mostly tied to the character's current skill mastery. The player will start play with zero perk points at level 1, meaning they won't have any perks. They'll gain their first perk point at level 4, and then gain an additional perk point every two levels afterwards. It's also important to note that of the 80 perks currently available in the Wasteland 3 beta, 75 of them are tied to specific ranks of specific skills, with only 5 of them being generic. That means it won't be enough to just have a perk point. You'll also need to have the appropriate number of ranks in the appropriate skill to actually unlock a specific perk. I think that pretty much covers the basics, so let's take a look at the skills and perks themselves. First up, we've got Animal Whisperer, which should be familiar to anyone who's played Wasteland 2. It essentially covers your character's ability to interact with the various animals you'll encounter during your travels. Outside of combat, it can be used to uh, interact with or even recruit neutral animal mobs. These potential animal companions come in two possible flavors. The first are larger, aggressive animal companions, such as dogs and bears, which will actively help you in combat. The second category are more passive mobs, such as alley cats, rabbits, or foxes, which won't actively help you in combat, but will provide you with a special passive bonus as long as they keep following you around. 
It is important to note that your two primary limiting factors when it comes to animal companions are that you can generally only have one at a time, with a few rare exceptions, but also that these animal companions can be killed in combat, so if you're not careful they will end up dying. Also worth noting, you can use Animal Companion on hostile animals as well, but it will not end up recruiting them. In those cases, having a sufficient rank in Animal Whisperer will instead allow you to scare off the hostile animal, which will grant a small amount of skill XP based on the difficulty of the animal, but will deprive you of the potential combat rewards. Now there are three perks that are specifically tied to the Animal Whisperer skill. The first perk, available at rank 3, is Animal Training, which grants an unspecified passive bonus to your Animal Companion's con and damage output, essentially making them both tougher and stronger. After that, we've got Spirit Animal at rank 5, which improves the passive bonus that certain animal companions will grant you. The exact bonus is unspecified, uh, but it is worth noting that this perk will obviously be completely useless if you're reliant on an attack-based companion, since they don't normally grant passive bonuses. The third and final perk associated with the Animal Whisperer skill is Vengeful Bond, which becomes available once the skill gets up to rank 7. This perk grants the player significant combat bonuses whenever one of their animal companions drops below 25% of their maximum con, to the tune of plus 50% crit chance and plus 2 action points. It's probably safe to assume, based on the wording, that uh, if your animal companion actually dies, then you will no longer receive this particular bonus. Moving on, our second skill is Armor Modding, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. This skill is used for the singular purpose of determining whether or not you are capable of equipping various armor mods, based on the difficulty of the mod and your current rank in this skill. There's only a single perk associated with the armor modding skill, Tender Loving Care, which becomes available when you hit rank 10. Just like the skill itself, this is a fairly straightforward perk, granting a flat plus 5 armor bonus to the entire squad, as long as the character who has this perk is an active part of that squad. Next up, we've got skill number 3, Automatic Weapons, which is the first of our combat skills. I should note real quick that, um, unlike the exploration and social skills, combat skills are obviously only usable in combat, but they also are the only skills to rely on RNG-based percentile rolls, whereas the majority of the other non-combat skills instead use hard-gated difficulty values, meaning that you either have a sufficient rank to pass a check, or you don't, no RNG involved. Regardless, the automatic weapon skill obviously covers your ability to use basic automatic weapons, such as submachine guns and assault rifles. Though it is interesting to note that certain smaller submachine guns are actually covered by the small arm skill, which might just be an oversight. From a gameplay standpoint, every automatic weapon has a skill rank assigned to it, and for each point below that skill rank the player's current skill is, they'll suffer a cumulative minus 5% penalty to accuracy. However, that is somewhat offset by the fact that each point the player puts into automatic weapons will also grant them a cumulative plus 3% bonus to their hit chance. As with most combat skills, the uh, automatic weapons skill has a fairly hefty amount of perks associated with it, starting with the puncturing shot perk at rank 2. This is actually our very first active combat perk, which in this case allows the player to fire a special 3 action point assault rifle attack, which can puncture through multiple targets in a row. It has a chance to apply the damaged armor status effect to anyone it strikes, but also inflicts plus 100% damage against any targets that are currently stunned. After that, we've got Gopher Hunter, available at rank 3. This one's a slightly more conventional passive perk, 
in this case reducing the penalty for firing at targets in cover by 25%. This is just one of the two automatic weapon perks that applies to both assault rifles and submachine guns, which makes it slightly more versatile than most of its peers. Next up, we've got Spray and Pray, available at rank 4. This is another active combat perk, in this case granting a special 3 action point attack with submachine guns that fires twice as many bullets as normal, but with a minus 25% hit chance. It also has the chance to apply the slowed effect to any target that it successfully strikes. To put that into context, your average submachine gun in the Wasteland 3 beta fires in bursts of roughly 5 to 10 rounds, depending on exact type. However, it's also important to keep in mind that your average low-caliber submachine gun round is going to cost about $2, so keep that in mind before you start hosing down everything in sight. After that, we've got Reckless, which unlocks at rank 6. This is another fairly straightforward passive perk, granting a flat plus 15% damage bonus with SMGs, but only when you're not in cover. It's your basic risk versus reward perk, but um, it is important to note that you can always retreat back under cover afterwards. Then we've got Double Tap, which is a passive perk that becomes available at rank 7. This one only applies to assault rifles, upgrading every second consecutive burst fired at a single target to an automatic critical hit. Your average assault rifle only costs 4 action points per attack, so uh, this is easily achievable by any character with 8 action points or more per turn. Then we've got Stormer, which becomes available at rank 8, granting a free submachine gun attack as long as you've moved at least 5 spaces immediately before that. This is obviously useful for uh, rapidly flanking enemy targets that are entrenched behind cover, but it can only be triggered once per turn. Which brings us to the final automatic weapon skill perk, Trigger Happy, which becomes available at rank 10. This passive perk rewards the player with 3 action points when they successfully kill an opponent with an automatic weapon, but they can only receive that bonus once per turn. Much like with Gopher, this appears to be the second automatic weapon perk that applies to both assault rifles and submachine guns, making it slightly more versatile than the others. Next, we've got skill number four, the barter skill, which, just like it sounds, is your ability to both negotiate for better rewards during conversations, but also to uh, passively modify the purchase and sale prices when dealing with NPC vendors. As the description states, each rank in barter grants you a cumulative plus 50% sell value and minus 2% buy cost. What it doesn't tell you, though, is that your default sell value is only 20% of an item's list value. That basically means you would need a full 10 ranks in barter to actually sell an item for its full list value. But at that point, you would also theoretically be able to repurchase an item for just 80% of its list value. As far as perks go, barter has two to offer, starting with Penny Pincher at rank 3. That one's actually deceptively useful, granting an extra 20% discount whenever you purchase items in stacks of two or more at a time. That's obviously a boon when it comes to purchasing things like ammo, medical items, or uh, most consumables, such as grenades or deployable robots. Unfortunately, it does not apply to any items that can't be stacked in your inventory, including things like weapons, armor, or even basic mods. The second barter perk is Antiques Appraiser, which becomes available at rank 7. This perk grants a 5% chance that when you sell a junk item, you'll get 5 times the normal value. That one's obviously a bit of a gamble. You've only got a 1 in 20 chance that each junk item you sell will net that bonus. It is worth noting, though, that you will find a lot of junk items throughout your career. Not to mention that uh, people who are willing to save scum will obviously get a disproportionately greater reward from this particular perk. Next up, we've got skill number 5, Big Guns, which covers both heavy machine guns as well as all flamethrower-type weapons, 
which are not exclusively limited to flames. As with all combat skills, each rank in Big Guns grants a cumulative plus 3% hit chance with relevant weapons, while also determining whether or not you meet the prerequisites for any Big Guns you want to equip. It also has more than its fair share of associated skill perks, starting with Move Up at Rank 2, a passive perk which grants plus 0.5 combat speed on the first turn of combat as long as you have a big gun equipped. Just to put that in perspective, your average heavy machine gun will cost 6 action points per burst, while your average flamethrower will cost 4 action points per attack. After that, we've got Suppressing Fire, which is available at rank 3. This is a special 3 action point attack that can only be used with heavy machine guns. Not only does this let you fire your machine gun at half the normal cost, but it also fires twice as many bullets in an expanded cone. Any target successfully hit by this attack will only suffer half normal damage, but will also be afflicted with the suppressed and slowed effects, which obviously reduce hit chance and combat speed accordingly. On top of that, it will also inflict plus 100% damage against any target that's already demoralized, which I guess means it would basically do normal damage. Next up, we've got Terrorizer, which is available at rank 4. This passive perk allows your flamethrowers to inflict the Engulf status effect, which engulfs them in flames and reduces their hit chance by 25%. That's obviously in addition to any other effects that the flamethrower might apply. Then we've got Pressure Cooker, which is available at rank 7. This perk grants a special flamethrower attack that is particularly deadly against enemy vehicles. It costs 3 action points and applies the pressure cooker effect, which prevents the enemy vehicle from taking any actions for 2 turns, while also causing it to lose 20% of its total con for each of those turns. After that we have Steady Shot, a passive perk which is available at rank 8, and only applies when your character is using a heavy machine gun. It essentially represents your character bracing themselves against low cover, granting a temporary plus 20% evasion and plus 20% hit chance as long as they're behind an appropriate cover object. That's actually a pretty significant bonus, considering that heavy machine guns tend to be some of the least accurate weapons in the game. Finally, that brings us to Wide Spread, available at rank 10. This is a fairly straightforward, passive perk, which applies to both heavy machine guns and flamethrowers, simply expanding their firing arc by an extra 35%. Coming up next, we've got skill number 6, Brawling. Like the other combat skills, it determines your effectiveness when using the relevant type of weapons, and grants a stacking plus 2% bonus to accuracy per rank. But what it doesn't tell you is that Brawling also uses a unique combo system, which provides additional stacking bonuses when you focus on a single target. The first stack of combo grants plus 20% to your crit chance and plus 50% to your crit multiplier, but only as long as you keep attacking that target. Each subsequent stack of combo adds an additional plus 20% crit chance and plus 25% crit multiplier, up to what I believe is a maximum of 5 stacks. It's important to understand how that combo system works because that leads us directly into several of the brawling perks. First up at rank 2, we've got Shaolin Surprise, which essentially serves as a finishing move for the brawling combo system. It's basically a standard brawling attack, with the added bonus that it also applies the stunned status effect, but it also consumes all of the stacks of combo on your current target. For every stack consumed, it inflicts a cumulative plus 1.5 penetration and plus 10 damage. After that, we've got Extreme Combo at rank 5 which is a fairly basic passive perk that simply raises your max combo to 10, allowing you to build up much more devastating critical hits when you're focusing on a single target. 
Then we've got Deadly Combo at rank 7, which further improves the Brawling Combo system by essentially doubling the critical chance that you gain per stack. Since the base value is plus 20% per stack, I'm assuming that means plus 40% per stack. That said, uh, I will admit I'm not sure why you'd want to have such a huge crit chance modifier. At 10 stacks, you'd have a plus 400% crit chance. That feels a little excessive. And that brings us to Flurry of Blows, which is only available at rank 10. This one is definitely a bit on the absurd side, reducing the base action point cost of brawling attacks by one. Considering that the average brawling attack seems to only take two action points per strike, that would effectively double the amount of brawling attacks you could make in a single turn. Up next, we have skill number seven, Explosives, which is another somewhat unusual skill. Although classified as an exploration skill, which means that it uses hard-gated skill checks, it's actually primarily used in combat to dictate how effectively your character can use various explosive devices. Outside of combat, its primary use is to disarm traps, explosive or otherwise, but it's also used as a prerequisite to determine what types of grenades and rocket launchers you can actually equip. Unlike most conventional weapon skills, you can't equip an explosive device if you don't meet the prerequisite. Similarly, because explosive devices in Wasteland 3 are 100% accurate, there is no stacking accuracy bonus for each rank you have in explosives. Instead, each rank in explosives grants you plus 3% to your explosive resistance and plus 0.1% to your explosive damage. Though, um, I have to assume that that's a misplaced decimal point. It seems a lot more likely that they actually meant plus 10% explosive damage per rank. But I guess we'll know for certain once we hit launch. As for perks, we've got Duck and Cover, available at rank 2, which grants a flat plus 20% bonus to explosive and fire resistance. Not the most exciting perk, but it is worth noting that uh, normally explosive and fire damage will go right through physical armor. Then we've got Bomb Recovery at rank 3, which grants a 10% chance to salvage a grenade whenever you disarm a landmine. I could definitely see that being useful, but the 10% proc chance seems awfully low. Just like with the Antiques Appraiser, I think it ultimately comes down to whether you're willing to take that chance, or whether you're willing to use the save system to essentially skew the odds in your favor. After that, there's Minesweeper at rank 4, which is another basic passive perk that basically makes you immune to setting off landmines, However, um, this one is particularly questionable because it doesn't grant that immunity to the rest of your squad, so they can still set off landmines by bumbling through them. It's also worth noting that the higher your explosive skill goes, the less useful this particular perk is, because you could simply disarm those mines instead. Next up, we've got Mortar Blast at rank 5 which essentially lets you make indirect fire attacks with your rocket launcher. This not only lets you make a rocket launcher attack for just four action points, but it also inflicts plus 50% damage to any target struck and completely ignores any intervening terrain. The only downside is that it does operate on a one-turn delay, meaning that your opponents have a full turn to potentially move out of the blast zone. Then we've got High Impact at rank 7, another fairly straightforward passive perk. In this case, it automatically upgrades any direct hit from an explosive device to a critical hit. That has the potential of inflicting some catastrophic single-target damage, but it is entirely reliant on your character's critical multiplier. Which brings us to Blast Radius at rank 10. Another very simple passive perk. In this case, it simply improves the blast radius of all explosive weaponry by a whopping plus 40%. Moving on, we've got skill number 8, First Aid, 
which is primarily used as a hard-gated prerequisite for a wide variety of medical items. Each rank in first aid also grants a stacking plus 3% bonus to the overall effectiveness of healing items, as well as a plus 10% bonus to the amount of health you heal when reviving a downed ally. Aside from that, the first aid skill is also fairly broadly used to diagnose injuries, discuss medical issues, treat injured NPCs, or even to uh, engage in forensic science, analyzing deceased bodies to determine cause of death. As far as perks go, we've got emergency response at rank 1. That perk grants a plus 1 bonus to combat speed for two turns when an ally is downed, presumably to allow the player to revive them more quickly. Then we've got Overhealing at rank 5, which essentially grants ablative health to any target that you heal, to the tune of plus 25% con for three turns. After that, we've got Physical Therapy at rank 7, which grants a small chance to buff a target upon reviving them, though the maximum chance of actually buffing a target is only 30%, and it doesn't actually say what the buff does. Not so sure about that one. Which brings us to our rank 10 perk, Hippocritic Oath. This perk grants a plus 100% damage bonus for two turns after reviving a downed ally. Not a bad bonus, but uh, its usefulness is going to depend on how frequently your characters get knocked down in combat. After that, we've got skill number 9 and 10, Hard Ass and Kiss Ass, which encompasses the totality of our social skills for Wasteland 3. While both skills are obviously dedicated towards influencing NPCs through dialogue, they do so in two very different ways, with hard ass representing a combination of intimidation and strong arm tactics, and kiss ass representing a combination of brown nosing and friendly persuasion. As the names imply, they are completely useless outside of dialogue, they serve no function in exploration or in combat. They're also two of the three skills that have no associated skill perks, so moving on. Next we've got skill number 11, Leadership, which, uh, just like in Wasteland 2, grants an assortment of special bonuses to all nearby allies. Now, it is important to note that the actual radius of the character's leadership aura is actually determined by their charisma, their leadership skill is only used to determine the actual size of the bonuses they impart. At its most basic, each rank of the leadership skill grants a fairly meager plus 1% hit chance bonus to any allies within their area of influence. However, performing any particularly inspiring actions, such as killing multiple opponents in a single turn, killing a boss-type enemy, or reviving a fallen teammate, will grant additional stacking bonuses to all nearby allies. Leadership only has two associated skill perks, the first of which is Rally, which becomes available at rank 3. This perk grants the player a special Rally ability that they can use during combat, costing them two action points, but granting plus two action points to all nearby allies for the next two turns. The second leadership perk is Demoralize, which becomes available at rank 5. Thematically, it's essentially the opposite of the Rally perk, granting a special combat action that costs two action points to perform, and demoralizes all enemies within your area of influence. The Demoralize effect will last for up to three turns, inflicting a minus 35% penalty to hit chance, and a minus 25% penalty to crit chance. Next up, we've got skill number 12, lockpicking, another fairly basic skill. Much like the social skills, it's essentially a single-purpose skill. Lockpicking is used to crack open locked containers, locked doors, and uh, even locked safes, though it is important to note that safes will still require rare, consumable, safe-cracker items to open. While the lockpicking skill does not have any associated perks, 
It is one of the most lucrative skills when it comes to skill-based experience gain. There are a lot of locks scattered throughout the game, and the more difficult it is to open a lock, the more experience you'll gain for cracking it open. Combined with a decent charisma, your dedicated lockpicker could easily gain several levels simply through lockpicking alone. After that, we've got skill number 13, Mechanics, which is primarily used to repair the various broken machines that you'll encounter during your travels. It's also used to repair or even buff friendly robots or vehicles, with each rank in Mechanics granting a cumulative plus 3%, to the effectiveness of any repair kits that you use. On a similar note, it also helps you against such opponents in combat, with each rank granting a plus 3% damage bonus against robots, synths, and enemy vehicles. The damage bonus can be further increased by taking the first mechanics perk, Structural Weakness, which is available at rank 3. A fairly basic passive perk, it simply grants an additional plus 20% damage bonus against robots and vehicles. Then we've got the Handy perk, available at rank 4. Another a fairly straightforward passive perk that simply makes your deployable units stronger and tougher. Now, sadly, most deployable units, such as robots and turrets, are single-use items, which automatically self-destruct at the end of a single fight but this perk will uh, make it slightly easier to justify the expense, granting a plus 25% bonus to both their con and their damage output. The last two mechanics perks, Reinforced Plating at rank 5 and Fortify at rank 7, both serve to uh, simply bolster your combat repair ability. Reinforced Plating will temporarily boost the max con of any robot or vehicle you repair by 25% for three turns, while Fortify will instead grant a plus 5 armor bonus for the next three turns. Uh, granted, not the most exciting perks, but they can be quite useful when it comes to keeping your mechanical friends alive. Next up, we've got skill number 14, Melee Combat, which is uh, pretty much exactly what it sounds like. This is another basic combat skill, covering both bladed and blunt melee weapons, allowing the player to use them without penalty, and also granting a plus 3% hit chance per rank. And as with most combat perks, melee combat provides a fairly broad assortment of associated skill perks, split evenly over both bladed and blunt weapons. First up, we've got Bleeding Strike at rank 2, a special bladed attack that costs 3 action points, inflicts plus 50% base damage, and applies the Bleeding status effect. It also, oddly, inflicts plus 100% additional damage against targets suffering from the Burning status effect. I'm not sure what the rationale there is, but uh, I'm assuming it's intended to complement the secondary effects of Stunning Blow. Speaking of which, we've got Stunning Blow at rank 4, which grants a special Blunt attack for 3 action points, that also inflicts plus 50% damage and applies the Stunned status effect. Similar to Bleeding Strike, Stunning Blow will also inflict plus 100% damage against Frozen targets, which makes slightly more sense. After that, we've got Striking Distance at rank 5, which grants a plus 0.5 combat speed, but only as long as melee weapons are equipped in both weapon slots. This is the only melee perk that applies to both bladed and blunt weapons, so I could definitely see it being useful to any character that wants to dedicate themselves to melee combat, but without restricting themselves to just one subtype. Then we've got Bloodsport at rank 6, a basic passive perk that allows blunt weapons to automatically crit against blind or stunned targets, obviously something which goes hand in hand with the stunning blow perk. Then we've got Hack and Slash at rank 7, another basic passive perk that, in this case, grants a free blade attack after every two consecutive blade attacks against a single target. Not quite as fast as brawling attacks, but bladed attacks do tend to inflict more base damage. Followed by Pursuit at rank 8, which is another basic passive blade perk, granting a plus 25% bonus to the crit chance of your next blade attack, 
as long as you moved at least three spaces beforehand. It also appears to inflict an extra 100% damage against slowed targets, though in this case there aren't any melee effects that actually appear to apply the slowed effect. Which finally brings us to Shrug It Off at rank 10, another passive perk for blunt weapon wielders which grants a cumulative plus 2 armor bonus to your character for every enemy that's currently adjacent to them. Next up we've got skill number 15, Nerd Stuff, which despite the silly name is your basic computer skill. Outside of combat, it's used to interact with computers and similar electronic devices, but inside of combat, it can be used to hack hostile robots. This will temporarily convert that robot into an ally, though there are two important things to remember. First of all, the robot will self-destruct at the end of the current combat, much in the same way that uh, single-use deployable robots do. Second, while your hacked robots will attack your enemies, enemies will not attack them back, they'll focus their fire on you instead. Unless you have Targeting Override, the associated skill perk that becomes available at rank 3. In that case, enemies will target your hacked robots as normal. The other two associated skill perks, Electric Leakage at rank 5 and Overclock at rank 7, both simply focus on further bolstering the abilities of any robots that you hack. The first one, Electric Leakage, will surround your hacked robots with an aura of electricity, which will inflict energy damage on all nearby enemies. The second one's a bit more straightforward, instead simply granting any hacked robots plus two to their total action points. Moving on, we have Skill 16, Small Arms, another combat skill which in this case covers pistols, revolvers, and shotguns, so it is surprisingly versatile. As with uh, pretty much all the other combat skills, it essentially dictates how effectively you can use weapons from each of those three categories, while also granting a cumulative plus 3% hit chance bonus per rank. As far as perks go, our first one is Shredder Shot at rank 2, obviously intended for shotguns. It allows the player to make an otherwise normal shotgun attack, which also inflicts the bleeding status as well as inflicting an extra 100% damage against any targets currently suffering the armor damage effect. After that, we've got Opportunist at rank 3, which is a nice, simple passive perk that grants plus 5% to your strike rate, but only when using handguns. That's an interesting one because handguns are obviously low penetration, low damage value weapons, but they can attack fairly quickly. Given that special strike attacks are 100% accurate and uh, can instantly cripple or even kill certain targets, it definitely adds a fair amount of utility to that particular weapon category. Which actually somewhat ties into Trick Shot at rank 5, another handgun based perk. This one grants the player the ability to make special Trick Shot attacks with their handguns, which cost 3 action points and suffer a minus 40% chance to hit. However, successfully landing a trick shot will instantly fill your strike meter, grant you plus 3 to your action point total, and apply the damaged weapon effect on your target. It will also inflict plus 100% damage against marked targets, a status that can only be applied by snipers. Then we've got another shotgun perk with clear cover at rank 6, it's a nice basic passive perk which simply grants plus 100% shotgun damage against destructible objects. Followed by the draw perk at rank 7, the only small arms perk that applies to both handguns and shotguns. This one's another nice basic passive perk which simply grants an instant free attack whenever you reload a handgun or shotgun. After that we've got devastation at rank 8, another passive shotgun perk. In this case, it cumulatively increases your base shotgun damage by plus 25% per enemy struck by a single attack. Which finally brings us to Counter Offensive at rank 10, another passive handgun perk. This one simply grants a plus 25% damage boost against a melee opponent who has just hit you in the previous turn. 
Not exactly the most exciting perk to go out on, especially since it's reliant on enemies actually hitting you, but I could definitely see it being situationally useful. Moving on, we have skill number 17, Sneaky Shit, which, despite the silly name, is your basic uh, subterfuge skill, covering both disarming alarms as well as your ability to sneak past opponents. The alarm disarming is fairly self-explanatory, though it shouldn't be confused with trap disarming, which is actually covered by the explosive skill. Generally speaking, alarms are less common, and they're usually more focused on alerting nearby enemies than they are on actively hurting your squad. As for uh, actually sneaking past enemies, we briefly touched on the whole detection system last time around, but suffice to say your detection time represents how long it takes an NPC to notice your character once they've entered their active perception range. By default, this is 1.8 seconds but each rank of Sneaky grants an additional plus 0.3 seconds to your detection time, up to a potential plus 3 seconds at rank 10. Each rank in the Sneaky skill will also grant the player plus 2% initiative and plus 0.1% sneak attack damage, though again, I have to assume that's a misplaced decimal point, because it would make a lot more sense for it to be plus 10% sneak attack damage per rank. As far as perks go, we've got Second Chance at rank 4, which simply adds plus one second to your overall detection time, followed by Close Call at rank 7, which grants a 50% chance that any alarm or trap you accidentally set off will harmlessly malfunction. That one's potentially useful, and there is some overlap there with the explosive skill, but it is worth noting that it becomes less useful the higher your relevant skills become. And finally, we have the Lights Out perk at rank 10, which again is fairly straightforward, simply granting plus 200% to your overall sneak attack damage. Though, just to clarify, sneak attack damage is only applied to an attack made before combat has actually been initiated. Next up, we've got Sniper Rifles, which is actually the last of our combat skills. In this case, it obviously covers how effectively we can use sniper rifle type weapons, while also granting plus 3% hit chance per rank that we have in the skill. Because the uh, sniper rifle skill only focuses on a single type of weapon, it has comparatively less perks than most other combat skills, starting with Mark Target at rank 2, which grants the player the special ability to mark a target for 3 action points. A marked target will suffer a fairly hefty minus 50% penalty to their evasion, while also suffering plus 50% damage from any precision strikes. It's also worth noting that, unlike most other similar abilities, there's no duration listed for marked target, so presumably it lasts indefinitely, until the target is destroyed or possibly until the player marks a new target. After that, we've got Masterful Precision at rank 5, an interesting passive perk which significantly, quote-unquote, increases your chance to inflict critical effects with a precision strike. This one's a little questionable, not only because they don't actually specify what your exact bonus is, but also because precision strikes with sniper rifles are actually relatively uncommon. It takes multiple attacks to actually fill your strike meter, and, generally speaking, you're only going to get an average of one sniper attack per turn. Then we've got the Concentration perk, available at rank 7, which is a passive perk that simply grants a meager plus 10% hit chance bonus, as long as you haven't moved for at least one full turn. Certainly useful, but also somewhat underwhelming. Fortunately, that is uh, somewhat offset by the incredible Chain Ambush perk at rank 10. This passive perk greatly enhances your ability to make ambush attacks with sniper rifles, allowing you to make multiple ambush attacks in a single turn, as long as each previous attack kills the target you were shooting at. Obviously not much use against larger, tougher opponents, but... um. Definitely a game-changer when it comes to uh, weaker but more numerous mobs. Moving into the final stretch here, we've got skill number 19, Survival, 
which is primarily used to avoid random encounters on the world map, though it also contributes towards hunting, camping, and other survival-related tasks. Aside from that, each rank will also grant the player a stacking plus 3% damage bonus against animals and mutant enemies. Compared to most of the other skills, the survival perks are almost disappointingly simple. The first one, Big Game Hunter, simply grants an extra plus 20% damage bonus against animals and mutant enemies. The second one, Explorer's Instinct, available at rank 10, instead instantly reveals all locations on the world map. I could see that being useful, but I have to imagine you could get the same effect by simply looking at a walkthrough or an annotated map. Next up we've got skill number 20, the infamous toaster repair. Obviously a staple of the Wasteland trilogy at this point. As the name implies, it is solely used to repair toasters which are unique containers that are hand-placed around the world map. That may sound a bit underwhelming, but every toaster contains a unique reward, including things like unique armor or weapons, unique trinkets, or even skill books. In some cases, they can even grant unique items that are then required to uh, unlock additional bonuses in other areas, as seen back in Wasteland 2. As far as perks go, the first two are dedicated towards increasing the amount of rewards you get from each toaster. The first one is Toaster Expert, available at rank 3, which grants extra cash and randomized consumables each time you repair a toaster. Now, I did do some limited experimentation with that perk in the beta, and generally speaking, the rewards were halfway decent. On average, it either offered 1-3 to three mid-tier consumable items, such as deployable allies and uh, powerful grenades, or it offered one mid-tier mod. It also offered an average of roughly $100, but um, I have to imagine that both the amount of money and the quality of the consumables will scale depending on the overall rank of the individual toaster. The second toaster perk is Breakfast Bandit available at rank 5, which also adds toast to the list of rewards you get when repairing a toaster. Now, this one I don't really have any context on. I didn't get a chance to experiment with it in the beta, and uh, in Wasteland 2 there was a single piece of toast you could get from a toaster, but it was exchanged for a fairly minor reward. My best guess is that toast is likely a potent consumable item, which will grant significant bonuses when consumed. But I cannot say that with any certainty, so um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. After that, the next two toaster perks are actually oriented towards making the toaster repair skill slightly more viable in combat. The first one is Heating Element, which simply grants a plus 25% bonus to the character's fire damage. That obviously only helps if your character actually uses fire weaponry, which means the toaster repair skill might actually synergize best with characters using big guns or explosives. And the final toaster perk is Toasty at rank 10, a passive perk which rewards you for killing an enemy by causing your next attack to also inflict the burning status effect. That brings us to skill number 21, Weapon Modding, another fairly self-explanatory skill. Just like armor modding, weapon modding is used to determine whether or not you can actually apply the weapon mods that you find. Unlike armor modding, however, weapon modding also seems to influence the amount of weapon parts that you get when field stripping weapons. I'm not actually sure what those junk parts are actually good for, Near as I can tell, they're just basic low-value barter items, with each junk part being the equivalent of one Colorado dollar. That actually ties into our first weapon modding perk, Expert Disassembler, available at rank 3, which grants a fairly modest bonus of plus 15% to the amount of junk parts that you receive when field stripping a weapon. After that, we've got Powder Packer at rank 5, which is easily a much more appealing perk, granting an extra plus 25% bonus ammunition whenever looting. 
It's particularly interesting to notice that it specifies a minimum of plus one ammo per stack, which can definitely help when it comes to ammo that's usually found in small stacks, such as energy cells or rocket ammo. Up next, we have Scrounger's Touch at rank 7, which simply grants an unspecified chance of granting an extra weapon mod each time you field strip a weapon. Now this could be a decent, if expensive, source of uh, potential weapon mods, but it really comes down to what that exact percentage chance might be. It also depends on uh, exactly how the loot mechanics end up working in the final game. In the beta, most enemies don't actually drop the weapons they're using, meaning you uh, might not actually end up with a lot of spare weapons to field strip. And finally, that brings us to skill number 22, Weird Science. And I'm not gonna lie, we don't have much context for this one. The two primary uses for Weird Science are boosting the crit potential for energy weapons and acting as a prerequisite for Weird Science devices. But I don't actually know what a Weird Science device is. We located several unusual devices in the Wasteland 3 beta, including solar lasers, mind control rays, and a bazooka designed to launch frozen animals at your opponents, all of them designed by a mad scientist, but none of them actually qualifying as weird science devices. Aside from that, each rank in the skill will also grant the player a stacking bonus of plus 0.03% to cold and fire-based damage, which, again, I have to assume is a misplaced decimal point. It would make a lot more sense for that to be 3% per stack. As for perks, we've got Atomize at rank 3, which makes energy weapons slightly more effective against non-conductive targets, to the tune of plus 1 damage per point of armor. Then we've got Overcharge at rank 6, which grants a special Overcharge ability for 3 action points, which allows the player to uh, boost their energy weapon up to three times, granting additional damage, but also a stacking chance that the weapon will backfire. Which brings us to Conductive Beams at rank 9, which grants a 10% chance for any energy weapon attack to create an electric aura around the enemy you strike, dealing additional energy damage to both them and any other nearby enemies for the next two turns. And with that, we are officially done with the 22 skills and the 75 skill-specific perks. But we do still have five generic perks to cover. Thankfully, these are all pretty basic, offering small but substantial bonuses to various substats. Hardened, for example, grants a plus 2 bonus to your overall armor, while Healthy grants a plus 35 bonus to your con the equivalent of just under 9 points worth of strength. Quick Reflexes grants a flat bonus of plus 5% to evasion, the equivalent of just under 2 points worth of speed, and Weathered grants plus 10% to crit resistance, equivalent to just over 3 points worth of coordination. Perhaps the most intriguing of the generic perks is Deep Pockets, which simply grants one extra quick slot, raising the base number of slots from 2 to 3. While somewhat underwhelming, this could be particularly useful to characters who use the Explosives, First Aid, or mechanic skill, all of which are fairly reliant on quick-slotted, consumable items. And now we are officially done. 102 line items, 22 skills, and 80 perks, covered in just under 60 minutes. I'm going to consider that a win. That said, my throat is on the verge of disintegrating, so uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Like I said before, this is all based on the beta version of the game, so uh, specific details are subject to change, but this should be more than enough to give you a general idea of how you can start planning out your ranger squad. Feel free to uh, let me know if you have any specific questions in the comments below, and we'll certainly see if I can help answer them. But otherwise... This is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Wasteland 3, 
You can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube channel, the Van Run Discord server, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on FIG. Links are in the description.